Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you all for coming. And uh, as Brenna said, my name is uh, Sister Maria. And um, so by show of hands, how many of you have been to Africa? <laughs> Nobody? Oh. Wow. OK. Um, so this is the map of Africa. And Uganda is located in East Africa. Can you see the red arrow? So that's where Uganda is located. Uganda borders Kenya and Tanzania. It is a landlocked country. By landlocked, I mean uh, it has no access to the sea. As you can see, it's only uh, Kenya and Tanzania that are uh, near the Indian Ocean. And uh, as you can see, it's a very small country uh, compared to other countries in Africa. All right, so um, before we move on, this is what I expect you to know by the end of this presentation. Um, I expect you to be able to list the different levels of education in Uganda and to describe the subjects offered at each level and also to explain the levels of dropout and what causes that and uh, to describe the assessment processes used in Uganda and also to discuss the impact of cultural values on the education of girls in Uganda. Uh, the structure of uh, the education in Uganda is as follows. Um, we have uh, three years of preschool, which is also known as kindergarten, and seven years of primary school, and four years of lower education, uh, which is also known as ordinary level. And uh, the fourth level is two years of higher secondary, which is known as A level or advanced level. And the last level is uh, three to five years of tertiary education. And this includes uh, colleges, medical schools, technical schools, and nursing schools. And uh, this education system has existed since the colonial times and uh, its emphasis is on training students to become uh, capable of doing uh, white collar jobs. So um, the pre-primary uh, pre level, which is uh, kindergarten, is not compulsory. Only parents who have money can take their kids to those schools. And um, so children join between the ages of three to six. Basically, it takes about three years. And uh, so the next level is the primary level. And uh, <coughs> The primary level is divided into two levels, the lower level and uh, the upper level. Basically, the lower level uh, takes three years. That's primary one, primary two, and primary three. And when kids join that level, they learn how to write. They learn how to read letters from A to Z and to read the numbers from one to 10, and sometimes beyond that. And uh, so teachers don't use textbooks when they teach students in this level. They use charts, and at times they uh, use stones. Um, I was, when I was, at, when I was at that level, I remember my teacher used to tell us, oh, when you go home, come back with stones, because they used to make us count stones, and then divide them or add them. And at times we would come to school with sticks, small sticks. They, the teachers would tell us, okay, now move these sticks, move two sticks and put them on the side, and then add two sticks. So two plus two, 
What's that? That was the right way to help us understand how to count. You know, at that level, it's really hard to uh, know, I mean, to calculate numbers in your head. And um, we used to write on the ground because many parents don't have uh, money to buy books for kids. At that level, kids don't know how to write. So I remember when I started uh, going to school, I used to write on the ground. Until I knew how to write A, B, and other letters, that's when I started writing in the book. Uh, it's common, especially in poor schools where um, kids come from poor families, but those who come from rich families, I mean, their parents can afford to buy them books, so it's okay. They can use as many books as they can until they learn how to write. Or, um, they sit for exams that are prepared by the Uganda National Examinations Board. And students who pass those examinations move on to the next level. Those who do not pass those examinations, they end up growing, dropping out of school. <clears throat> and so, uh, the education system uh, in Uganda is based on quota system and uh, schools begin in February and they end in May, that's the first quarter. And the second quarter begins in June and ends in September. And the third quarter begins in September and ends in December. So the longest break is between December and February. And so this, that's the usual class schedule for all schools. Chat um, above represents the number of uh, students who join school at the primary level. As you can see, um, the green area represents the students who begin at uh, primary level. Uh, it's a higher percentage compared to those who join uh, lower secondary level. And as the levels increase, the number of students drop down. Uh, those who join upper secondary level, that's the blue chart, I mean the blue area. You can see it's smaller. And those who join tertiary or uh, university, colleges, and medical schools, the number is really small. Um, the main cause is because uh, many parents cannot afford to pay for their kids uh, to attend higher education because the higher they go, the more uh, expenses they have to uh, pay. Uh, the tuition goes high. So, and the government provides universal primary education for all. Which, makes, which helps many to attend uh, primary. So then, um, I also wanted to talk about the curricular development. Um, for most subjects, there is a subject specialist, like uh, someone who specializes in math, uh, or English, or geography, um, and so many other subjects. They come and uh, make uh, the they make curriculum for the whole schools and usually they go out and um, <clears throat> monitor schools to see how they are doing uh, whether they are fulfilling what is required of them and they usually sit for a period of three years to talk about the the curriculum um, and at times they are forced to close some schools if they are not fulfilling what is required of them, if they are not following the curriculum. Um, we also have the National Assessment of Progress in Uganda, uh, which started in 1996. And this monitors the changes in achievement level over time. The curriculum and assessment takes care of special needs for students. That's, um, that's very common in many cultures in Uganda. And uh, 
So women are expected to take care of the household and to take care of their siblings. At times, they are asked to come back from school and take care of their siblings in case of any need. But boys stay in the schools as long as they want. And to me, I think that's not fair. I mean, I've been there. I'm talking out of experience. There are times when, I, when my parents requested me to come back and take care of my siblings because I'm the firstborn out of 90 children. And uh, because I had a goal, I was focused. I was not stopped by the chores. I knew I had to do my duties and do my homework. I had to find my, my own time. And for some girls, they lack this attitude. They get so much involved in the uh, chores and they forget to do their homework. And when they go back to school, um, at times it's hard for them to catch up with uh, everybody else. And at times they are told to go back home if they're not performing well uh, in class. So this is very common, especially among those who come from poor families. And so as you can see, um, girls with low education, that's the only job they can do. The first picture shows you that's a young girl. She's having a baby. She has to take care of that baby. And she's carrying a banana. So in Uganda, we eat bananas. That's our staple food, bring bananas. And so I think she's getting ready to prepare lunch. And I suspect she has other children at home waiting for her. Um, and as you can see, she's not uh, in very good condition. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of work they do. And this one is digging with her baby at the back. And so those who have uh, elder children, they can take care of their siblings. Like I said, I took care of my siblings when my mother was working on the plantation and when she was doing other chores because I was old enough. But those who have babies as the firstborns, sometimes they have to take them wherever they go. Whether it means to fetch water or firewood or cooking or cleaning the house, they have to go with their babies. And so, like I said, you know, not every woman is facing the same challenges. I think you can tell from me by looking at me um, when you compare me with the two ladies I showed you. Because of my education, I am different from those women. And there are a couple of women in Uganda who are also different. They are living different lives. Because of the education they received from their parents. Um, the first picture shows you that uh, that woman is a nurse. She's taking care of a patient. And this, in this picture, there are women leaders. Some of them are members of parliament. Yeah, that's, those are members of parliament. They are sitting together with men. But the percentage of women who are in, uh, uh, who work in hospitals, um, who are in leadership positions is very, very low. It's only those who come from uh, rich families that have been able to uh, reach that level. And um, so I feel a need that women need to be uh, more empowered. They need to come up because I know they have the potential um, to do a lot of things. So if someone tells you to go and do research about uh, a given problem and you complete that, what's the next step? Figure out solutions. Exactly. Exactly. Did you hear what he said? Yes. You have to figure out solutions. So um, my solution, um, to this program, I mean, we are just beginning. Uh, we are forming an organization called Empower Your Neighbor. And what we are doing 
we are going to open up a website and um, we are going to connect potential donors to women in Uganda and uh, help them with the finances. Um, women will, will use that money to um, buy pigs and um, they will sell those pigs to earn money to send their children to school. Like I said, uh, boys are given first priority to, to go to school. So our goal is to make sure that women get enough money to send their girls to school, to make them, um, I mean, to help them have a better future. When you educate a woman, you educate the whole nation, right? Yeah, so that's what uh, we are planning to do. And um, so, you, I like the way you're sitting, um, those tables. So I want you to, to form groups, so one, two, three, four, five, five groups, and uh, discuss about that question, and um, come up with uh, answers. Which group wants to share first? <laughs> Okay, uh, Cindy. Yes. We want to hear you. <laughs> well, what we were saying is that it's, it's kind of difficult for us to know how, there's so much we don't know. So we don't know how the community members work together, but some of the uh, situations, some of the suggestions we had is um, having some kind of a co-op where parents could share child rearing du duties, well, you know, some women could go out and work in the field or do their chores and then come back and watch children together while the other parent does their trick, so that, does their work so that the children didn't have to be involved in all of those duties they could go ahead and study. That was one thought. And then the third thing we talked about is the importance of health education. Mm. I'm sorry to say this to a Catholic person, but birth control <laughs> or, <laughs> um, you know, health education, if they didn't, if, if having so many children was a financial burden to them, maybe they could learn better mm -hmm. about how to. Family planning. Family planning, yes. right. Those are great ideas. And, um, you know, I think I didn't mention this, uh, that some families are far apart <laughs> and some families live together. Those who live together, the children play together. Like in the evening after school, they play together, they go to, um, they fetch water together. I mean, they have that uh, communal gathering, but it's not very common. And uh, those who live um, in isolated areas, they, it's hard for them to send their kids to um, play with the other kids they have to make sure that they do everything by themselves. And I like the idea of uh, educating people to have a minimum number of kids they can take care of. And um, oftentimes I tell people that, why do you have 10 kids when you can't take them to school? Because I value education. It's really hard to take kids, 10 kids to school uh, if you, are, you don't have enough money. And for some people, you know, like I said, cultural values have a big influence on the way things do, I mean, people do things. Some people think that, oh, uh, culturally, we are supposed to have any number of children, like 10 uh, or 15. So education is key uh, to solve this problem. And we need uh, to do more of that. You know, it's kind of hard to change the cultural values, but one step at a time. Thank you for sharing. Those are great points. Good job. Group A. <laughs> yes, the next group. I think the first thing is to uh, sensitize the population. I think this is the first thing before providing or helping them in funding the micro project, mm -hmm. we have to educate the population to sensitize them, to know, to let them know, have more information about uh, the benefits of sending women to school. Mm -hmm. Because 
And this fact also happened in my country a long time ago. And what the government did was to create some school only for girls. Mm -hmm. We have some we have some school like high school girls of Lakewood or high school girls of Tacoma only for girls so that and before doing that they just sensitize the population because sometimes in our place the men is always and is still the master piece of the family and it could be uh, intimidate of seeing his wife educated because mm -hmm. she could say hey I know my rights or I know what yeah, that yeah, be exactly. intimidated. So. And the solution could come from the lower position of the country and also to the higher position like the government. Good. Um, I like the point you said about um, men feeling um, that they have the obligation of heading the family. They feel that they have the authority to say everything in the family. And I think that's common in all African countries. And um, yeah, I think it's better to work with the government and uh, to make people more aware of the value of education and uh, having all girls' schools. I mean, only girls' schools can also help. Um, yeah, that's a good idea, but you need to start with the parents. You need to make them um, aware of the value of education because you might, you can start up a girl's school and parents might say, oh no, I'm not sending my girl to school. So education goes all around. Thank you for sharing. Good job, group. So one of the main issues we saw was, of course, the financial problem um, is huge, but also the culture and the social mores, it's going to be really hard to send your girls to school when they don't have role models. Mm -hmm. So we thought of um, a few different things around that issue. Um, Young suggested the mm -hmm. Peace Corps has had a huge impact in countries mm -hmm. um, with role models. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember in your biography you mentioned your first teacher uh, was a female and you didn't right. realize that there was any option for your future outside the home until you met that teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, that role model um, really had an impact in your life. And I think that um, if girls had more to look up to, even in the few textbooks that they do see, if we mm -hmm. can, um, if they had more to look up to, than, like females in leadership and, right. and the peace work. Yeah, those are great ideas. Um, it's true I had a role model in my life. And I also had the support from home. And I'm sure there are girls there who do not have, um, I mean, there are female teachers in some schools, but they are not enough. And uh, so if kids have role models, I think that can help them to study harder. If they see their teachers teaching, maybe they can say, oh, in the future I want to be a teacher, or I want to be a nurse. Um, and uh, you talked about uh, Peace Corps. Um, do you know which countries they go to? I mean, students go to? Can you say more about that? Oh, I don't know which countries they go to, but uh, I believe that there are many countries that American Peace Corps went mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I said is Korean government is really appreciating Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. Korea became who we are because of Peace Corps people came. Mm -hmm. And they actually did not come and live. They lived with us so many years. Mm -hmm. And then they created those role models. By living with them, we saw what of how you could improve your life. Mm -hmm. So that's how Korean government think they are who they are because Peace Corps people showed how to live better, how to share better, how to empower your neighbors. Mm -hmm. So now Korean government is the biggest um, in the uh, group number of uh, sending people overseas. Now they said that America, thank you, you send us that many, mm -hmm. now we're sending back. So it, it's time for them to giving back. So they are sending to many other countries. That's a good idea. I think I need to look into that. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. Yes. I like. The mother thinks is like this. 
edu with education we can change our our life. So and also uh, this came from my mother open minded about uh, education. So the first thing we have to educate the and encourage the the parents to know about the powerful of education. I agree with that. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Um, education is the key to everything. Parents who are not educated, sorry, uh, they do not understand the value of education. If someone went to school, of course they will understand the value of education and they will send their kids to school and they will, like we, we, we said, this group discussed about having, I mean, educating women um, about having fewer children. I mean, if you went to school and you know how important education is, you will have fewer children. Um, so everything surrounds up around education. Um, um, yeah, thank you for sharing. And can we hear? Oh, you talked about your model. Can you tell us more about your model? My mother? Motto. Uh, motto? Uh, yeah. My mother motto, actually. Ma yes. Uh, she always say like this. Uh, in our country is rice is our main food rice is our main food mm. sometimes she said like this even we only eat rice but at least uh, my kids go to school and then that's yeah, a good and one. then my mother always say yeah with your education you can change your life and your fam your our family life also that's so the piece I get from your motto is sacrifice. You have to sacrifice something. Yeah, so that's why uh, when I was in college, mm -hmm. every day we wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. That's a sacrifice. Yeah, uh, yeah. we make a cookies mm -hmm. and send to the uh, small market around our, our home. Right big sacrifice you yeah. know people like me who are not morning i mean there are some people who are not morning people i mean they they don't they are not morning persons yeah. what's the right word morning persons or morning people yeah. morning people thank you uh, so waking up at four it's a big sacrifice because you know the value of education you will wake up anyway and make sure that uh, you achieve um, your goal Oh, thank you for sharing. The idea of the micro-funding is such a great idea for women to become more independent and mm -hmm. self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. But we were wondering in our group um, if the women become um, you know, successful in that, if the men might resent them making more money or you know, becoming more of themselves. So how, do, how would women handle that? That's a good... I, I mean, that happens among the educated, educated families, but at times, um, women have to be stubborn. <laughs> um, like you saw the last picture I showed you um, about women working in the government, uh, in the parliament. Some of them had to divorce their husbands because their husbands saw them as um, way too high. They were more educated than they were, and they were earning more money than their husbands. Some of them had to take that risk because they cared about their children. And um, things started working out. They started sending their kids to school and uh, I mean girls to school and those girls now have families and they, are, they know um, so they are not uh, they are not uh, I'm looking for the right word um, subservient hmm? Sub Sub yes but they are not restricted by the values. They are kind of coming, moving towards the other side. Um, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. 
So I think you will all agree with me that uh, change, we all talk about change, but do we like change? We don't. S sometimes you have to take a risk. If you know what something, you, if you have um, a specific goal, you have to take a risk. And after some time, you may come to appreciate that um, you did that. And I think to answer your question, um, there are some cases that have happened, but uh, women have to take that uh, risk. They have to risk in order to be able to help the future generation. My, my wife is Japanese, and so where, where, where she comes from, mm -hmm. uh, women have to make the choice between the career and having children. Mm -hmm. They're kind of in a whole different, different problem, but it's kind of the same, same background of, of men having power. Um, one of the things that's going to change there or change anywhere is that when men in society see the value of um, shared responsibility and shared power, and I, I, I see it in my own life how great it is to have a very strong and um, equal woman in my life. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, I, it's, it's actually great. So if we can show that to men, I know men are pretty insecure sometimes when it comes to change. Um, right. Yeah, even me, of course. But, um, <laughs> That's, that's a big part of the problem. Men just don't see the value of it yet. And when they do, um, like she said, it's, it's actually solves a lot of problems. Right. Thank you for sharing. That's just one more. Um, mm -hmm. I was thinking about what other people are saying, and I remember reading something by uh, one of the Supreme Court justices, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, mm -hmm. was talking about, um, I mean, I, I'm a little older than some of you. You might not remember, in the 1960s, uh, my mom, uh, who was uh, married and then moved into divorce, mm -hmm. could not do anything without her husband's signature. She couldn't buy her house, she couldn't, huh. I mean, she had to have a second signature on anything. So it wasn't so long ago in America that women were fighting this fight. And this uh, Supreme Court Justice, Justice Ginsburg, um, said that one of the things that really made a difference was when the daughters in the homes mm -hmm. of the congressmen and the senators were educated about uh, their own rights and their and were empowered with that desire for change mm -hmm. from in the family the the men were changed when they hadn't been changed in the public debates so i think when you have an educated daughter in your family mm -hmm. a loving father mm -hmm. uh, can be changed too so that's just another aspect of it right that's a perfect example <coughs> i would never have thought that americans started the that way, so that gives me hope that uh, we can make a difference in uh, my country. I want to thank you all for um, this wonderful uh, participation. I learned a lot from you, and um, I hope to continue making a change, I mean a difference in the lives of girls in Uganda, and you know, I invite you all, of, I mean, I would like to invite all of you to work together with me. You know, I believe in collaboration. So thank you so much for making these arrangements for me to come and uh, share my, um, share the education system in Uganda and a little bit of my story. Yeah.